Well, when I was a young teenager, sometime in the early 80s, we went to Wyoming to visit some family friends and never had seen a place so flat and barren in my life. But it was adventurous for us, seeing antelope for the first time, you know, thunderstorms out in the open prairie and stuff. It was pretty cool. But one of the things we got to do that I loved was we explored a ghost town. There was an old Western town that was all falling apart. And so here's a little picture of a ghost town. That looks a lot better than the one that we saw. But, uh, and we explored there. We found old bullet casings. We found old pieces of glass, which we, of course, imagined were from the 1800s which I'm pretty sure a bunch of them were just 22 shell casings that somebody was shooting at rabbits or something. But we used our imaginations. It was amazing to see this old, broken down place, you know? We went into the old hotel and into an old saloon and all that. And then just down the road, if that wasn't fun enough, we got to dig for fossils. And so we went to this place. Uh, there were these layers of sandstone, which you could hit. And this is not me. This is just some kid. <laughs> just some kid on some fossil website from the area we were at. But uh, yeah, you could hit it with like a hammer and it breaks apart. And then you pull, pull apart all the little flakes and you'll, you'll see some fish in there and things. And man, it was cool. But one of the things that you really start to learn after a while exploring ghost towns and looking at fossils is that nothing in this world lasts forever. There are whole worlds that we look back on and say, wow, that is amazing. And we imagine ourselves being there, but it's gone forever. Everything changes. We long, though, to believe that the things that we enjoy and depend upon will always be there, that they'll be permanent. The disciples did too. Check this out. In Matthew 24, when they saw the beautiful temple, it says, Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to, the point, to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, you see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will be none, not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. One day this magnificent temple would be destroyed and every stone overturned. In 1 Corinthians 7.31, earlier in this book that we're studying, it says, for the present form of this world is passing away. And so though we enjoy the world we're in, perhaps the present form of our existence in the world that we experience will one day be no more like those fossils and like that ghost town. In Psalm 102 verse 25, it says, of old, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe and they will pass away. But you, God, are the same and your years have no end. So the good news in this jury thought of things changing and passing away is that God never will. He is always the same. And in that, he provides for us not only himself as the main permanent aspect of our existence, but also the very thing we're talking about today. There is something permanent here today, something outside of heaven and earth, something from God himself. And that is love. And that's what we're talking about today, love. 1 John 4, 8 tells us anyone who does not love does not know God. Why? Because God is love. If you really knew him, this God that's eternal and will never pass away and he will never change, you would know that he is love. He's the ultimate standard of what love is. In John 4, 16, God is love. 
And whoever abides in God or abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. So what kind of love then are we talking about? Because we've spoken of a number of different words for love. You know, we can throw around words like I love pizza, I love my dog, you know, or I love my wife or whatever. These words for love. The first that we talked about was the word storge in the Greek language, storge, which is a natural affection. Kind of like a mother for its child or a child for their parent. Then there was the other kind of love called eros, which is a romantic or where we get our word erotic from kind of love. And then the word phileo, which is a love between dear friends. We call it brotherly love, but it's that love between dear friends. But the love that we are talking about is none of those. It's not a familial love. It's not a romantic love. It's not a friend love. It is the Greek word agape, not agape. That's a fish, agape. Now, this word means, and I have it on the screen here for you, love that sees someone or something is infinitely precious and is willing to pay the ultimate price for it. It is self-sacrificial. It's an all-in kind of love. And this is the kind of love that God has for us. If we look back on this chapter that we've been studying, chapter 13, the love chapter, if we were to see the outline that we've been following, the first thing we looked at is the priority of love in verses one through three. That you could have all the spiritual gifts in the world, on steroids even. And if you have not love, you're just a bunch of noise, or we are nothing, or we gain nothing. There'll be no heavenly reward for the, the great gifts somebody has that are used without love. God is not impressed. We can fool each other, but we can't fool God. The priority is love. And then in verses four through seven, we saw the character of love and how Jesus Christ himself personifies love in the most perfect way. And so if you were to reread that passage and put Jesus in the place of love, then it all makes sense. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus does not envy or boast. Jesus is not arrogant. You know, and you just go through it and it makes sense. Love is personified in him. And then we are called to personify love like Christ. So if you then go put your name in there, does it work? Dale is patient. Mm. I don't know about that one. Dale is kind. Sometimes Dale does not envy or boast. You know, put your name in there and go through it. Do you represent love? So anyway, the character of love. And then today we're looking at the permanence of love. And so that leads us to verse eight. Love never ends. Love never ends. The word never here is not ever. <laughs> no time in the past and no time in the future has love ever failed. Love is permanent. Love is perpetual. It never ends. If we were to look at this word end here in the Greek language, it means to fall to pieces, collapse, or become ruins like that ghost town. With regards to a person, it means that they would fall, suffer defeat, or fail. The world is covered with magnificent cities that have fallen, become rubble, and have been buried by time. And archaeologists spend time digging up the history, you know, layer by layer. I used to want to be an archaeologist, mainly because of Indiana Jones, but, you know, studying history is kind of interesting. Every empire has fallen. Every building falls apart. 
But agape love never ends. It never falls apart. If you truly have this kind of love, God's love does not, you, you can't fall into it and you can't fall out of it. Okay, so sometimes we talk about love that way. I fell out of love, you know, and well, then it wasn't love. Maybe it was eros, you know, <laughs> maybe it was phileo or something, but it definitely wasn't agape. Agape love will never die and leave us. Agape love never fails us when we fail. God's love is consistent and it's perfect. God's love never grows cold for his children. Even though he knows you fully, he knows all of your mistakes, all of your regrets, everything that you're ashamed of, the things that you hide from other people so that they don't reject you. God knows it all and he still loves you. You know somebody loves you when they know you that well and they still stick with you. That is our God. And so we love because it is the fruit of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit we spend a lot of time talking about. But the fruit of the Spirit is always preeminent and more important than the gifts. And that's what we learn. The gifts can be nullified in a sense in God's eyes if it is not with love. So love is the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. You know that you're a child of God when you resemble your heavenly Father by loving. It's a sign of Christ-likeness. This is real hum um, maturity, actually. It's real maturity. Sometimes we think maturity is knowing a bunch of good facts and, and being able to answer questions in Bible study or, you know, how much we serve, how much we do stuff for God or how much money we give or how many people we take care of. But maturity ultimately is love. All those other things, if it flows out from love, it's flowing out from true maturity, true Christ-likeness. So love never ends. As we go on in verse eight, we see our second point that we will no longer need spiritual gifts when Christ returns, okay? So as prof for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. Paul points out two spiritual gifts that the Corinthians prized highly. They were really crazy about these gifts. They, they loved to see them. And if anybody expressed these gifts, they were like held up in high regard. Wow, they're awesome Christians. And those two gifts were knowledge and tongues. And so they thought that was just the coolest thing. And if you could have great knowledge or speak in tongues that you were a mature believer and everybody wanted to be like you. But Paul says, you know what? Those things are gonna pass away one day. They're not as important as you're making them out to be. Paul also points out one spiritual gifts that we're gonna see in the next chapter that he sees as one of the most useful gifts in the church, and that's prophecy. But he even says that will pass away. So these gifts are going to pass away. We'll no longer need them one day, but that does not mean that they aren't important today. Okay, and so if they weren't important, then God wouldn't give us spiritual gifts, but he has, and there's a reason for it. Spiritual gifts, we're told, are the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in our midst so that we can experience God as we meet together as the body of Christ, the Holy Spirit bridges the gap between heaven and earth, so to speak, through these gifts. And so between the throne of God and the loneliness of earth, God uses spiritual gifts to step into your world. He uses them to bridge the gap between our weak imperfection and his perfection in glory. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says this, to each 
is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. So what does that mean? Well, when we use our spiritual gifts, God shows up, he's manifested, and he builds us up through one another for the common good. Not so that one person could stand up and be applauded while everybody else are just second-class Christians, but that we together as a body of Christ would build one another up each using our gifts. That's why the gifts are important. In this age where we await the arrival of Christ, he provides us with the helper, the Holy Spirit, with his presence. And he even calls us individually the temple of the Holy Spirit, our bodies, as well as the church is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so we experience God here together. We build one another up. Without love, these gifts do not correctly represent God. And so sometimes people get disenchanted with church, right? Sometimes it's because of their own sin maybe, and they don't want to have to face it. But other times, perhaps, it's because love has been put on the back burner and performance has been put on the front burner. Well, in verse nine, we've been told these gifts will pass away, but it says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. So we live in a time right now that our relationship with God is only part of what it will be one day. This is not all there is. It is going to be beyond your comprehension so much better and more glorious than any human mind can imagine. And so what we have right now is real, our relationship with God, and he is present and it is powerful, but there's so much more that's gonna blow your mind. What we have here is called partial, which means we're lacking full potential. Um, What we have right now is not fully adequate. So this condition of imperfection, and sometimes you feel it, you know, I wish I could just get a hug from Jesus. You know, have you ever thought that? I wish I could just see him, you know? This condition of lacking the fullness will one day be gone and we will have the fullness. And that's what it speaks of. Perfection one day is coming and it is close. It is near. When this, we're looking at this passage, sometimes we miss this, but this is clearly an eschatological context. Well, what in the world does that mean? Eschatological is a cool theological word that talks about the end times, the eschaton, you know, the end times. Um, This passage speaks of the end times. It's speaking of the end of this age, that it will be gone one day, and the beginning of something completely new. Thank the Lord that this right now is not it. That this body that I have is not it. You know, (laughs) that our imperfect experience on this earth is not it. He has something amazing. And that's called perfection. The word perfect, as we look at this in the original language, means the highest point of achievement or excellence when we are fully mature and complete without defect. It refers to the fullness of our salvation that will occur at the return of Jesus Christ. When he comes back, At that moment, his people will be transformed in the blink of an eye, we're told. We'll we'll read about it in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. In the blink of an eye, those who are alive on this earth, when he comes back, will be instantly changed and we will be glorified and given that heavenly body that will be an eternal body and not only have the desire to fellowship with God and to obey him, but will have the absolute ability to do it 
because this sinful body will be done away with. Perfection will come. Spiro Zodiades in his Greek dictionary says this, teleon means the final destination of the believer. That is heaven. As contrast to the full age in knowledge and understanding. Teleon indicates the ultimate goal of heavenly perfection as contrasted with the immediate and merely partial experience of saints on this earth. It refers to what we call theologically as glorification. It's part of our salvation process where when Jesus died for our sins on the cross, we were justified. You know, when we put our faith in Christ, we were regenerated. We became new creations. Right now we're being sanctified, which means we're being made into the image of Christ. But one day we'll be glorified, the complete final step of our salvation where we are utterly transformed. So this word teleon means that perfect state, the goal, that which your heart's been longing for. It's coming. Be hopeful. When we see this word used in other passages, it, it goes like this. There's the relative verb of this adverb that we're looking at. Um, is the word completion in Philippians 1.6. Check this out. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion, to perfection, at the day of Jesus Christ, when he comes back. There's the relative noun is also used at the beginning of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1, 7, when you see the word end here. It says, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ who will sustain you to the end. He will sustain you until perfection. The frustration you feel the failures you experience, God's love and his presence and his power will sustain you until he gets back. He'll sustain you guiltless until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, that is good news. And this is all based in his love. His love will bring us to that point. And so perfection begins when Christ returns. He will show us personally who he is. We'll see him with our eyes. He'll reveal to us what his word is from his mouth. We don't need others to do this with their spiritual gifts when this happens. That's why the spiritual gifts kind of go away is because now Jesus is there to do that for you. He'll do it directly. And so in verse 11, it goes on. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up my childish ways. Okay, so the word child here is interesting. It's, it's from two Greek words. It, it's from two words. One means not and the other means word. Not word, which means somebody who's so young, they can't speak yet but they do speak their own language, right? We used to joke around and call my daughter's language Abanese. She had her own little language. You know, she didn't have the words, but she had the noises and her mind knew exactly what she was saying, right? So it's a child that's still unable to speak, very young, often still nursing and dependent on milk. And so Paul says, when I was a child that was unable to speak, I spoke like a child. One of my other kids who actually does love to speak and uh, one of my sons, before he could speak, he would sit in his high chair and he would, I don't know if he was preaching or what, but he would put his hand here and he would go, you know, he'd just go on and we would just laugh and laugh. Yeah, it was Austin. Okay. 
It's kind of like tongues, you know. <laughs> he didn't have the words, but his heart was there. Paul's like, I, I, I spoke like a child, you know. And then he said, I, I thought like a child. You know, when a, a child, their state of mind is different, you know. It's how they see and understand things as a baby. They want to explore an object. You know, you might search on Google to explore an object, but a baby, if they want to explore an object, it goes in the hand and then to the mouth and their little tongue goes all over it. Uh, you know, that's their thought process and exploration. Then they reason differently. Paul, Paul said he reasoned like a child, which is the way a child judges things or decides things or arrives at certain solutions. And so they might reason in their little minds, you know, mom must not love me if she leaves me alone in my room by myself. Well, you know, their reasoning's off, right? Or if I throw a fit, then I'll get what I want, you know, and, and they learn real quick. Sometimes it actually works. Um, other times it doesn't, but they still try. But Paul said, you know, I used to be that way, but I put it all aside when I became a man. Now, most of us men have given up childish ways, but you know, once in a while, our wives might say something different. But all those things are entirely appropriate for that age. Entirely appropriate, but not for an adult. And so Paul says, when I became a man, I gave up my childish ways. Though every one of those stages of growth is necessary for proper childhood development, we are expected to advance beyond it. So no longer do we need binkies or onesies with little snaps in the back. All right, I guess some guys have those. We don't need teething rings. We don't need baby diapers. We don't need cribs, strollers, car seats. We can go on and on and on. All those things we've done away with. And thank the Lord. I mean, we have much cooler toys now, right, guys? Power tools, cars, <laughs> trucks, whatever. Spiritual gifts are like those childish things. We are right now in the scope of eternity in our spiritual infancy. Now, even though they are childish things, you don't take them away from a baby because they still need them. They're still important. Spiritual gifts are the same. They are here for us now. They're important. We need them. But one day we will look back on this existence and we'll be like, man, I'm glad we don't have that anymore. I've become so much closer to Christ. He's right there, you know? And so there will come a time when we see our existence on earth as the cater caterpillar life. Imagine a butterfly, you know? After it's been in the cocoon and then it reemerges as this beautiful creature that's flying around and it's not bound to the ground like a lumpy little caterpillar that's slow and has to eat leaves and, you know, that butterfly looks down and goes, man, poor little guy, he can't fly like me. One day we'll be like that, It's glorious butterflies. And we'll see our existence today like that. But here's the thing, we're never going to look back on love and think, man, that was childish. Never will we look back on love and say that was so immature. Love remains. Love is the same. In verse 12, for now we see it a mere dimly, but then face to face. It's interesting that Paul likes to use an illustration using a mirror here. Uh, most of us, when we choose a mirror, we like to get the mirrors that make us look slender 
You ever notice that? There are the mirrors that you go in front of and you're like, oh, (laughs) I don't want to look at myself in front of that mirror. So, you know, the mirrors that they sell you for your closet doors and stuff, they just kind of make you look a little longer and skinnier. And we like those mirrors. I like those mirrors. I always look buff in those mirrors. (laughs) They're kind of imperfect, but they're a lot better than the mirrors that were made back in the day. In the ancient city of Corinth, they were known for manufacturing bronze mirrors. In those days, mirrors were made of polished metal, not like the mirrors we have today that are super accurate, but they were just shiny pieces of metal that if you get close enough, you can see a reflection in it. And so ancient mirrors were made of all sorts of polished metal, the reflection was not as clear. And so Paul uses this word dim, dimly. We see in a mirror like dimly. And I like this word dimly because it's enigma. Sound familiar? We get our word enigma, which means a riddle or an obscure saying. Here it's something impossible to fully understand. As we look and try to understand spiritual things, as we try to perceive the Lord, it's like looking through one of these imperfect mirrors. We can see, yeah, it's there and it's fairly accurate, but it's still a little hazy. Our vision is indirect, which leads to partial and incomplete knowledge our understanding of heavenly or spiritual things are like this right now. They're somewhat enigmatic. I mean, a lot of things we know specifically for sure, the word of God says it. God's revealed it to us, but there's a lot we don't know. Now, if you can imagine yourself looking into one of these mirrors made of polished metal and you get close enough, you can see your face and somebody walks in the room behind you, you'd probably see a form or a shape come in behind you, but you wouldn't see it super clearly. You might be able to even recognize who it is, but the details of the person you wouldn't see through the mirror. But imagine then turning around And you see the person standing behind you face to face, not having to look through a reflection that's imperfect, but you could look right into their eyes and see them personally. That is what Paul is talking about. In our relationship with God, a lot of times it feels kind of dim, but one day we are gonna see him face to face. Face to face when Christ returns not an indirect vision, but a vision that will blow your mind, (laughs) will make you want to fall on your knees and worship. This word face in the Old Testament and new um, means presence or proximity to someone understood in terms of their face. Think about if you've ever been in a crowded room full of people and if you felt alone, you felt lonely. There's plenty of people around you, but you, you feel lonely until somebody turns their face towards you and they welcome you and connect with you. That's this understanding of face. It's not only presence, but interaction and relationship um, with the implication of being right in front of them. In the Old Testament, the word face is translated presence, the presence of God. It uses this phrase to speak of seeing God personally. In Genesis 32, verse 30, Jacob um, saw a manifestation of Christ so, so Jacob called the name of the place Peniel when he wrestled with God. Um, if that doesn't sound familiar, read Genesis 32 and you'll get familiar with the story. But a, a guy shows up, he just starts wrestling with him all through the night. 
And then he says, bless me. You know, he realizes that this is somebody special. And he called this place Peniel, where he wrestled with God through the night and says, for I have seen God face to face and yet my life has been delivered. In Exodus thirty-three eleven, speaking of Moses, it says, thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man would not depart from the tent. I always love that picture of Joshua. That interaction between God and Moses is so powerful. Joshua just sits there stunned, you know? It's like, I just want to be here. I just want to hang out. Sometimes it's like that after a good church service. People just want to hang out. Um, it happens. In Judges 6.22, then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Angel of the Lord is again the pre-incarnate Christ. But this word face to face, you see it's like a direct experience with God, but the face to face that is coming is even more so. It's not just a manifestation of God or a theophany. This is a literal experience with God himself. And Paul might have had in mind as he writes this passage, the relationship that Moses had with God compared to the relationship other prophets had with God. Check this out in Numbers 12, verse six. It says about Moses, and he said, hear my words, if there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him, I speak mouth to mouth, clearly, and not in riddles or in enigmas. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then? were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? But even what we will have in that day is more than what Moses had in the Old Testament. In the age to come, there is something awesome about to happen. And 1 John 3, 2, it says, Beloved, we are God's children now. And if you look around the room, you might not realize it, it's not like people have the glowing halo over their heads like some of those old pictures. But we are God's children now and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is, as he really is. In that day, spiritual gifts will no longer be needed. But until that day, they are important. So Paul is giving us this great perspective to not get out of balance between love and gifting. Love is always more important. And he goes on to say, now I know in part, then I shall know fully even as I have been fully known. If you know someone the first word for know here means to experience and learn about somebody through a personal relationship. You know, you could say, I know, I know who the president is, but you don't actually know the president, you know, uh, unless somebody here does. Um, you would have to have a personal relationship with them to use this word to know. But then when it says know fully, it takes this word to know to a higher level. It's Instead of gnosis for no, it's epignosis, which means to know and understand fully or like more than just that basic relational knowledge. It goes way deeper that you're so acquainted with that person. You know them completely. One day we will know the Lord that way. Right now we have to read our Bibles, go to Bible study, 
and have people teach us and seek the Lord through the word to know him. But on that day, it's gonna be like the light will get turned on and our experience with him will be brought into fullness so that you will just know him. How cool will that be? How will we know him? Well, Paul says, even as I have been fully known. So how does God know us fully? Well, he knows everything about you. He knows the trivial facts about yourself you probably don't even care about. How many hairs are on your head? You know, how many breaths you took last night? He knows it all. In 1 Corinthians 8, 3, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. God knows you. Galatians 4, 9, but now that you have come to know God, or so we think we do, and that's why he says, or rather to be known by God. Isn't that comforting? That when you're saved, the more important thing is that you are known by God. What if you got dementia one day and you start throwing punches and cussing and stuff, but you were a believer, you know? And maybe you don't remember God still remembers. So we've come to know God, but rather we're known by God. And how can you turn your back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world? You know, and he goes on. He knows you before you were born. He knows details about you you don't even care about. And in Psalm 139, 16, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They could not be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. How does God know us? Man, completely and utterly. Our name is engraved on his hand in Isaiah 49. Our name is written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. Revelation 13. So how will we know him fully? Even as we are fully known. Man, what will that be? I have no idea. My brain can't conceive of it, but it's gonna be awesome to have that kind of fellowship and knowledge of God. Well, the last point, love is the greatest Christian virtue. And this is just the last verse in verse 13. Now, so now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. There's so much more to our eternal existence than we could ever imagine, but there's three things, three virtues right now that we express that will continue on with us. Faith, hope, and love. Now, when our kids were little, um, there were traits about each one of them that we didn't realize were going to be like part of their personality until they grew up. And as they got older, we could look backward in time and say, we saw that attitude when they were like six months old. Or we saw that really cool trait in their personality when they were like three months old. And it just matured over time and stuck with them. I mean, that's one of the amazing things about being a parent. And if you're a parent, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, For us with the Lord, these are three characteristics that will carry on with you as you mature. Faith, hope, and love. The great triad of virtues. Uh, Paul mentions it a bunch of times. I'm not gonna read all the verses to you right now because we're running out of time. Now, faith and hope were already part of the definition of love. If you were to look back in verse seven, love bears all things, believes all things. There's belief. Hopes all things, endures all things. So if that's part of love and love continues forever, well, so does the part 
lots of love, faith, and hope. In eternity, we will continue to express faith. You know, there's faith that leads to salvation, but then there's this trust in the Lord that we call faith as well. And when we look at eternity, we trust in the Lord, believing always in his goodness, in his love for us, that we're always loyal to him, and we'll give him our heart in faith. You know, so we don't often think about faith as being something that happens in heaven or whatever, but you know, Satan and the fallen angels place their faith in the wrong thing. Not that we would do that, but faith will continue. It's that trust, that love, that loyalty, making God the center of your universe. But then hope, how is hope used in heaven? You know, I've heard people say, well, I wouldn't want to live forever because that would be like hell or something, you know? But you know, hope, hope is an eager expectation of good things to come. So that if you have hope, you're looking at eternity going, man, this is so good. I do not want it to stop and it never will. You will never be in that place in eternity where you're like, man, I wish I just became nothing. <laughs> You'd be like, man, I wish I could just have more, more to worship God with, more. So there is hope in eternity, but there's also love. We will continue loving God. He will continue loving us and we'll continue loving each other if you didn't get it right down here, you have all eternity to get it right up there. <laughs> We're gonna be with each other. We'll be with the Lord. Well, I wanna end with this application. Three things to be challenged with. Number one is that God's love for his children never ends. If love never ends, that means God's love for you never ends. God doesn't grow tired of you. And you may have had people in your life get tired of you in their own hearts and minds and reject you. God's love never ends. He will not one day just get up and decide, yeah, you really irritate me. I'm out of here. Now he's known you from eternity past and he knows everything about you and he still loves you. When you know God's love for you never ends, it gives you confidence like nothing else. So if you've been rejected, if you've been abandoned, if the loves in your life have not been consistent, then turn to the one love that is and always will be, God's love for you. Rest in it. Rejoice in it. Number two. Love is the only lasting investment in this life. And man, if you've been riding the stock market roller coaster the last year, <laughs> you know how important putting your investments in the right thing can be. And I would encourage you, because love is the greatest, it's the greatest thing that we can do. One day when we stand before God, he's not gonna judge you on how cool of spiritual gifts you had, it's how you use them in love. If that's true, then how are you investing in love today? In your love for God? In your love for one another? I mean, money's gonna disappear, careers are gonna end, success will be forgotten. Places that are named after important people will be renamed. The only thing that lasts is love. So are you investing in it? Your time, your energy, your resources, your prayer, your gifts. Well, then lastly, love is the perfect way to function in an imperfect church family. Most of our cars, probably all of our cars, have something called shock absorbers. You know, the whole point of it is that when you're driving down the road, you don't feel every bump 
and pothole um, as much as you could. You know, it absorbs the shock and it makes the ride more um, doable. Love in a church where people offend you, people might fail you. And if you've been around long enough, you learn leaders are not perfect. And we can get really critical or even cynical after a while. But you know, when love is there, love is like these shock absorbers that can take all those hits and continue on faithfully loving each other until that day when perfection comes, you know? But until then, are you practicing love in the body of Christ? Or do you feel every little bump? So that on your way home from church, you're like, could you believe what that person did? Could you believe that? And we get so uptight and hurt and whatever. But man, love. Love overlooks a multitude of sins. Love covers over a multitude of sins, you know? So love is the perfect way to function in an imperfect church family and the church will become more mature when we love. So love will never end, praise the Lord. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love, that you are the ultimate standard of love and nobody else. And for that, we praise you. We, we thank you and we pray that we would resemble you, our heavenly father, in the way that we live on this earth. We look forward to the day when you come back and perfection comes. Lord, there's just so much more. Pray for anybody that's bored in their relationship with you that they would be inspired today. There's so much more. And we give ourselves to you, Lord. We pray for our country this July 4th. We pray for a revival in this land. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.